From the get-go, we asked him if he wanted to author with us, and he said, I can't. I can tell you stories, other people can tell you stories, but I cannot write this. Uh, it's too debilitating. Welcome to the Stroke Cast. A Generation X stroke survivor explores rehab, recovery, the frontiers of neuroscience, and how to peel a banana with one hand. Hello, I'm Bill Monroe, and welcome to episode 111 of the Stroke Cast. In the uh, last episode, we heard from Bill Torres, the subject of the book Falling in Love with the Process, a Stroke Survivor's Story. Now, in this episode, we hear from the authors of that book, Drs. Patricia Geist Martin and Sarah Parslow. They are communications professors at schools on opposite sides of the country. That means this conversation actually ends up being a little bit different from most of the episodes. We talk less about stroke specifically and more about things like communication theory, the nature of qualitative research, uh, the role of story in people's recoveries, writing about disability as a temporarily abled person, and other topics that really sort of get just kind of meta. And of course, we we also talk about the amazing storytelling of, of Bill Torres and just what an experience it is to you know, just be listening to him share these amazing things he's done through his life. After the interview, I'll talk a little bit about how this episode and the last episode came about. But for now, let's meet Patricia and Sarah. Patricia and, and Sarah, thanks so much for joining us on the show this week. Great Thank to be you here. for Yes. <laughs> well, you know, this is great. Uh, I'm I'm really excited because I I got my my bachelor's in communications many, many years ago. So so it's always great to connect with folks who sort of stayed in the field and continued that academic path that uh, you know, I, I graduated in '93. I was like, I'm gonna take a year and then I'm gonna go to grad school. And I, of course, I never ended up doing that. But uh, <laughs> so how would you define or explain the field of communication studies to folks outside the space? Well, um, it's a it's a pretty broad ranging field with lots of different subfields that make it really comprehensive. But I think a lot of times people get confused because they see the word communication and they think immediately of journalism or film or television studies. But we're really, our discipline is really about human communication and understanding relationships, communication in relationships, groups and organizations. Also in the mass media, really trying to understand the kinds of messages that are communicated to the large society. I think that really is a way for us to come at this book from a lot of different perspectives. Sarah and I have similarity, but very much differences. So she probably would love to answer that question as well. Yeah, I think you've done a pretty good job there. Uh, you can think about this as studying the processes of forming and maintaining relationships is one way to think about it. So relationships and interpersonal interactions, relationships that form within organizations, relationships that form between organizations and their publics in a mass communication um, perspective. So you could think about messages that are designed to influence people's behavior. So like the roots of our field are Aristotle and Plato and all those old Greek folks who are like, how do we persuade other people? So that's like the, the roots. But we in, have also, in my show yeah. on public speaking, yeah. I uh, I still go back to ethos, pathos, and logos. Yes. Oh yeah, yeah. Yes. That's like <laughs> it's the one thing my students remember. Right? So, <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, so you're thinking about all those messages and how do they occur, and how do human beings create meaning and attach it to their environments? Right, and I think the other part is um, our field has evolved over the years. Uh, not to think about the way we communicate as always an effort to persuade someone else, but as Sarah is saying, an effort to really create meaning in relationships, which means instead of working to persuade, we might work to invite someone to tell us their story, and we invite others to listen to our story. So I think more of an invitational uh, way of thinking about it rather than just persuasion. <laughs> 
can a relationship exist without communication? Hmm, that's an interesting question. I would say that communication is the core of forming relationships, and that communication is a relationship in my perspective. So I would say no, but maybe Patricia has a different perspective on that. I think we try. I mean, actually, in many cases, our, our best relationships with our partners, our families, and friends can happen just by being in the same room and really appreciating the silence. Um, people will say, gosh, I haven't seen this friend in 20 years, and it feels like we never left. And part of that is just the being with each other, but a part of that is how you are able to communicate and talk with each other in a way that is very fulfilling. And most communication people would say this phrase, which is that you cannot not communicate. So even if I am sitting in a room across the table from you, you are still communicating with the other person non-verbally. I'm still reading your body. And your choice not to say anything is also uh, also communicates something to me. Perhaps I think you're angry with me or maybe you're shy, but I'm still thinking about the meaning of your behavior. So for us communication people, you cannot not communicate. Perfect. Yes. Excellent. You know, I think this, this has now got me thinking I, I'm going to have to explore this this concept a little bit more uh, in the future. But looking at now the challenges that tie that folks with aphasia live with in this whole broader communication context, where suddenly you lose access to your words, but your whole internal monologue is still happening. And then the impact that has on a relationship uh, when you go beyond just the, the frontline obvious stuff, it's, it's really an incredible space that, that happens out there and, and that, that people um, with, with stroke or other neuro conditions have to live with. Right. Yeah. And we, we associate communication with verbal communication, with saying something or writing something down. But there's a whole repertoire of communication that is not tied to words specifically. And if you are a stroke survivor or you know a stroke survivor, you know that you adapt to how to convey your meaning in different ways that might not rely on words. And oftentimes your friends and family adapt to that. They learn the other ways in which you make your desires and thoughts known. And I know, you know, even in our book, um, the oldest friends of Bill are Tom and Melanie. And they said when he first had his stroke and couldn't talk, they just sat by his bedside and held his hand. And that's communication. And that's, that's some really powerful communication. Everything from just touch, just the sheer presence, just from the sheer value of being acknowledged by just being in there and being heard even when you cannot speak. Yes. So, uh, you know, obviously, as, as you're working on the book, falling in love with the process, a stroke survivor's story, what is it about your training in the field that sort of uniquely prepares you to write a book like this? Well, I would say, uh, for me, my training is both in organizational communication and health communication. Those are my broad sort of sub-disciplines. And I think from the get-go, I realize that Bill's story is just not a personal story. It is a personal story for sure. And it's his journey and the story he has to tell of his journey through the medical system and doing all that he did with providers and family and friends to actually create a survivorship and advocacy. But I think the other part of it that we learned through Bill's story is that the, the journey isn't a solitary one. It is an interpersonal one, but it's also an organizational one because he traveled through from the emergency room, critical care, to rehabilitation, and all of these organizations played a part in supporting him through his process. So my training, both in health communication and organizational communication, allowed me to ask questions and think about Bill's story from those two different areas. <laughs> 
Yeah, we're really used to, as communication scholars, not just listening to a story as you would, you know, with a friend, like, tell me the story of this thing. But we listen to stories with some questions in the back of our minds always. We're asking, what is happening here in the way that this person is framing their story? How is Bill making sense of his experience in the process of telling this story? What are some of the memorable messages that he took up that guided his recovery? You know, what kind of character is he making of himself? Is he in a hero's journey in his story? Or is he, you know, how is he framing himself in telling this story? What are the relationships, the characters in the story that are making his recovery possible? So we're not just listening to stories because they're awesome and hilarious, which all of Bill's stories are. <laughs> Always like, oh my gosh, you did what? Right? But we're also thinking, like, how is this story functioning? And how are the characters in it functioning to support Bill's recovery or not? One of the really interesting things that came out of uh, my conversation with Bill was that when he gives his talk, when he shares his story with folks, is that he talks about himself in the third person instead of first person. He talks about this guy, Bill, who had a stroke rather than saying, I had a stroke. Yeah, it's really interesting, which actually made it fun to gather his stories because he... He talks in dialogue, like full on dialogue, which I don't think many people do. Like he'll reconstruct <laughs> like a whole scene for you just in the way he tells a story, which is fascinating because you can get a sense of like all, all of the messages that were at play in this interaction he had. And actually, I think that's such a good point because Bill talked about his need, his really important need to talk about himself in the third person because the minute he talked about himself in the first person, it was overwhelming. And so from the get-go, we asked him if he wanted to author with us. And he said, I can't. I can tell you stories. Other people can tell you stories, but I cannot write this. Uh, it's too debilitating because for years he was going to write this book because everyone told him, write this book, write this book. But every time he would try, talking about himself in the first person didn't work. And also, you know, Sarah and I bring expertise about organizing and structuring and interviewing that Bill doesn't necessarily have those skills. So the book became something very different than it would have if he just had sat down and tried to write a book in the third person. And I think one of the things that he was finding is that when he wrote his story down, it somehow made it more real for him. And some of the painful parts of his story now lived on a page in front of him. And it was hard for him to you know, he was starting to relive some of the things that he had already processed. But reading the story written from our perspective, where he's a character in the third person, he can maintain a little bit of distance from it, but still get reimmersed in his own experience. So it's like a, it's like kind of put up a little bit of a wall between his own story and himself. And I think what Sarah's saying is is really important for us to communicate to anyone. Um, who's going through what Bill went through or any kind of illness is that, and family members and, and, and friends is you can't always just ask the direct question and expect that person to be able to tell you that story. There's a real important process that we have to really respect and honor. And that is that we have to listen to the person who's going through what they're going through and allow them to tell it and be in it the way that they want. And sometimes that means not talking and not telling the story. So I think there's a real honoring process that comes from listening and not just assuming that the other person has to tell their story. Well, I think one of the things that's that's really interesting that you point out there, that that importance of listening, uh, that's something I, at, when I, back in the past when I was hiring, that was one of the most important things I would do when I was interviewing job candidates or when I do other interviews is that the most important skill I, I can have as somebody asking questions is to just shut up and let people talk and let that awkward silence linger because so many times people will just fill it with amazing stuff. Exactly. Oh, yeah. And actually, that's the best therapists use that strategy. And when they hear a phrase or a word that someone's using, they grab onto that and say, well, 
what is that like for you, that part, that piece? Um, so using the language that the person gives you when you listen carefully. So, so as you're going through this process and you're putting in the time and the work in, in writing this book, how do you, as an author, navigate the difference between telling Bill's story and sort of telling your story of learning Bill's story? Yeah, I think that was a, a tricky process at first because it's not just it's not just the author and Bill. It's also it's a group of three, right? So we have two co-authors and Bill, and each of us has a particular story that we're bringing to the the table. One of the things that we tried to do was to recreate our process of actually talking with Bill. And so you'll see at the beginning of every chapter, we, we ground ourselves in where were we when we were interviewing Bill? What was happening? What did the environment look like? What, did, what were we feeling and acting like in that moment? And so it's always grounding first in the fact that Patricia and I are human beings listening to Bill tell fascinating stories and responding and thinking, how did you live all of these things in a single life? <laughs> um, and then, I mean, the dude yeah. brought racquetball to the United <laughs> States and yes. Arby's. I mean. <laughs> yes. And he'll just tell you random things like, oh, yeah, at one time I was a school teacher and I brought my students to go train with Muhammad wow. Ali. He just like these things just like pop out of his mouth all the time. And so some of it was starting our um, our process of writing with being there in the moment with Bill as if we're sitting down with him. And responding in very human ways to the things he's, he's telling us. And then we will shift to just telling the story that Bill has been telling. And sometimes it will be trying to preserve his actual words. So have him tell his story in the actual dialogue. So we actually recorded all of our interviews with him. So we had the audio. And so some of the stories are literally him telling you in his own words. And then some of the stories are written from a kind of third person, all knowing perspective where we're trying to give some details, right? So he'll tell a story, for instance, about living in Venezuela, teaching um, the American children of Standard Oil employees, right? So I'm like, that's really interesting. So I'll do some background research about what Venezuela was like at the time and what it must have been like to live in this little village and fill in the background. Um, so we had kind of like three modes going on. Some of it was us telling our story of just hearing Bill tell us these crazy things. <laughs> Some of it was the mode of giving Bill the his literal dialogue. And some of it was then moving backwards even further and doing some background research so that we could paint a fuller picture for the readers about the stories Bill w was telling us. The fun part for us, too, was we traveled all over San Diego interviewing providers who remember. People remember Bill. So they remember, even though it occurred all these years ago, <laughs> they will tell you the story of when he first came in to the hospital, the emergency room. His friends, they remember very vividly. So for us, it was also a journey of not just being with Bill, which was always fabulous. Uh, it was being with people who really love and care for him and remember him without a doubt. And they want to take us into those moments that they spent with him. So in a way, the book travels all over the place in terms of Bill's life. And what we realized, this was really Sarah and I using our expertise at qualitative research to really analyze the transcripts and come up with the idea that this is not just a stroke story, this is a life story. So the book has this way of moving and braiding his personal story with his stroke story, and it comes again at the end where he begins advocacy. So his life story catches up with his stroke story. So it's a very unique structure that I don't think anyone just sitting down to write a memoir or to tell their story would necessarily know how to do. And I think that's the uniqueness of our book. Yeah. So it, it's, it's kind of fun because you shift back and forth between different parts of Bill's life. So you'll start with, you know, the story of him growing up in San Diego at the end of the Great Depression, at the start of World War II, 
as Pearl Harbor's bombed, right? And, and so you get this like really rich description of what it was like to grow up at that time. And then the next chapter, you'll switch to him waking up from the stroke and thinking about how all of the life lessons he learned as a young child, growing up in a really topsy-turvy time, start to come into play in the way that he thinks about recovery. Um, and so we move back and forth in that way. One of the things that's fun is that oftentimes we'll hear the same story told by Bill, but then also <laughs> by his friends and healthcare providers and other people. And so we can kind of piece together, like who said, there, there are multiple people, people there and they have slightly different versions of what happened. So you'll hear the story of Bill, the day of his stroke, told from Bill's perspective, but also from his best friend who was there. And they're not the same story. There are some things that don't line up and we're not sure, you know, what is true or not. <laughs> we're like, ah, uh, how did it really happen? But so you get this really complex, not just what happened, but also how people made sense of it and perceived it a little bit differently. And that's a lesson in and of itself, because people forget that sometimes. It's like they say, oh, I know what happened. And someone says, no, it didn't happen that way. And everybody kind of holds on to their truth without recognizing that people are seeing it very differently. And there isn't one truth about the situation. We make meaning differently. And so that's a perfect example of that. And one of the lessons of neuroplasticity is that every time we recall a memory, we're actually rewriting that memory and re-encoding it. And again, one of the reasons when we get into some of the practical implications of what we study uh, or, or what you study in the communications field is even things like uh, eyewitness testimony in criminal cases is the absolute least reliable form <laughs> of evidence there is just because of that uh, that variability. So, yeah. Uh, so as we're we're talking about this, so I mean, how did you even meet Bill? Well, <laughs> Bill is so funny. Um, I actually was working out at a lake really near uh, with a group of like five uh, friends, and we're lifting weights, looking at the lake, and because that's the kind Bill of thing you do in there. San Diego. Yeah, you get to do it all year round, which is fantastic. <laughs> But all of a sudden, this man comes over, and you know, I forget how old he was then. He was in his seventies, like late, late sixties, early seventies. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, and and he's, you know, he's saying hi there. You know, we're like, all of us are looking at each other, like, uh, we don't know this guy. We don't know what he wants, but we're working out here. But he was, he's so gregarious and he's so charming, and he starts telling me the story of having this complete debilitating stroke and paralysis. And I'm like, no, you're lying. It's not, no, there's no way. And he goes, yeah. And he starts telling me this story. And I'm like, oh my gosh, would you come to my health communication class and tell this story? And he said, I'd love to. And so we really started a relationship that day and he was there at the lake to feed the ducks. And what you learn in our book is that feeding the ducks was part of his recovery process because I think since his stroke, which is, I don't know how many years ago now, um, he has missed only like two or three days of feeding the ducks. And so he has relationships with ducks. And so that started the process. And as I had him come to my class on several occasions, he goes, well, you got to write a book. You got to write a book about me. I'm like, oh, Bill, I, I have a lot on my plate already. And he goes, no, no. He goes, you got to write it before I die. And I'm like, uh, <laughs> Bill, Bill. So I started thinking about it and I got kind of serious about it. And I said, I really don't want to do this alone. And I'd worked with Sarah in the past and I called her up and said, would you be interested? And she said, I would. So I'll let her take over from how she met Bill. Yeah, I had actually um, known Bill. I was, uh, I got my master's degree at San Diego State. And so That's I had right. met Bill because one of my classmates um, interviewed Bill for a class project. And so I heard about this, like, really interesting guy who loves feeding ducks. <laughs> he had a stroke. I'm like, hey, he sounds interesting. And so when Patricia called me, I had this context of who this guy was. And I was really interested in uh, this charismatic person 
And a lot of my research looks at, well, at disability primarily, but then thinking about concepts like advocacy and self-advocacy, about how people remain resilient in response to health-related identity threats. So things like in, experiencing stigma, for instance, or experiencing uncertainty. Um, and so these are all the concepts that I, I, I nerd out about. <laughs> and I also just really wanted to meet this guy. So Patricia's like, you know, come on out to San Diego, which, you know, most people would be okay with going to San Diego. It's, it's a pretty nice place. So, <laughs> so I met Bill at his, uh, you know, early morning duck feeding. You know, we walked walk together around the lake and, and fed him some, you know, fed the ducks some bird seed. And, and yeah, I was really taken with this this character and so i was i was hooked i was in one of the things that comes to mind as you're talking about just this experience of working with bill and of how you end up telling the story in the book is that it it calls to mind the structure of the movie the big fish are you familiar mm, with that yes. one yes yes and, you know, it, it, you know, perhaps a little bit less fantastical, but <laughs> just a little bit. <laughs> yeah. And I think we were inspired by playing with story structures a little bit. Um, we watched that movie Arrival. <laughs> Have you seen this one? I, I have not with seen that one yet. Aliens Arrival. I don't want to, like, spoil it, okay. right? But it's not, it's not like a straightforward from start to finish timeline. They move back and forth, and, and you don't necessarily realize in, until the end that not everything was in the same timeline, straightforward. Mm. And so part of this was thinking about, yeah, how does playing with time and moving back and forth, what does that open up when you're telling a story and trying to see connections between earlier points in time and later points in time? Um, and trying to understand a human being as not just a one moment in time, but the accumulation of like all of your experiences. So, yeah, that was really fun. And, and actually, for my, for my students, when, when he stood before my class, and there would be 150 students in my class, and every semester I would have doctors, nurses, hospice workers, physical therapists. I had all these professionals in, and they were great speakers. But in the end of the semester, who was their favorite speaker? It was Bill. Bill just had a way of speaking. And I think what they saw in Bill that they didn't necessarily see in all the others is a sense of his resilience. That after going through all that he went through, here he stands before them in the class talking about his vibrancy for life, his interest in telling his story, his interest in helping other people who have survived a stroke. And so he was a walking, talking example of that concept of resilience. And I think that meant a lot to them and why they picked him as their best speaker of the semester. That's great. The, the, I mean, there's that tremendous power in storytelling and when you can have professionals come in who can deliver facts who can tell you about something that's just not nearly going to connect with an audience nearly as much as when you tell a story and connect to that uh that's what we were talking about earlier getting back to that uh the logos mm -hmm. is great but if you don't have the pathos mm -hmm. and the ethos you're not going to be as effective a speaker in exactly. sharing the truth so one of the things you mentioned uh, as part of this process and the expertise you bring is uh, qualitative research. Uh, I think that's probably a pretty academic term uh, that most of my audience probably not encountered. So what is qualitative research? Is it a form of scientific research or what is that and how does that inform what you do? So qualitative research is a form of research. It's an approach to gathering data um, and not just gathering data, but immersing yourself in data and um, making meaning. And so when people think about social scientific research, we often think about quantitative research, which is lots of numbers, right? It's conducting surveys, it's conducting experiments. And that kind of research is often designed to try to explain predict, and hopefully, in some instances, control underlying patterns of the ways that people interact. 
So the assumption there is that there's some sort of like underlying pattern. This is the way that the human animal communicates and that we can kind of predict it. Qualitative researchers think a little bit differently. <laughs> Our goal is not necessarily to predict and control, but rather to understand at a deeper level how people are communicating about a particular context. So what are their motivations? How do they make sense of things? How do they attach values and norms to the way that they interact in a particular context? And so instead of trying to generalize, here's how people communicate and we can predict it and control it. It's more about why do people behave the way that they do? What motivates them? And we're really tapping into culture. And so in order to do that, qualitative researchers do collect data and create data that is more text-based. So things like interviews, focus groups. We also have this concept of autoethnography, which you'll see in the book, which is using your own story as a form of data. So writing down your own experiences, thinking through your own experiences as a form of, um, of data that we can collect. Um, so it's, it's a... I, I think it's a lot more fun way of doing scientific, social scientific research. Yeah, yeah and oh, go ahead. So, so how does that, I was going to say, how does that, when you talk about using your own story as data and getting data from these stories, how does that compare to the idea of just anecdotal information? How can you generalize from that to draw broader conclusions? Well, more often than not, we're not trying to generalize to a whole population. Uh, when we do qualitative re research, we're really almost like um, getting into the depth of a particular cultural group or a particular group of people to try to understand what's going on for them. And so even though we do see patterns that might cross, let's say we interviewed 20 survivors of stroke. Uh, we, we talk about the concept of theoretical saturation, which may be going into too much detail here, but basically what happens is after maybe 15, analyzing 15 interviews, we start to see people saying the same thing, that, that there's sort of a pattern here. And so what we're really trying to do is offer a conclusion about some kind of pattern that we're seeing with this group of people. And even though we might infer that other stroke survivors might feel the same thing, we know that in different situations, in families that aren't supportive, in, in people who have to go through survivorship alone rather than have a group of supportive friends, it might be different. So more often than not, we're not trying to generalize to the larger population the way that a quantitative study might, because usually the numbers of people that we're interviewing or working with is a much smaller subset than, say, having 250 people fill out a survey. Um, and so it makes it very, very different. I think the other part of this that for me is fascinating to sort of take off from what Sarah was saying is, what we really discover as well is that as people tell their story, they're often finding out and learning something they didn't know before they started to tell their story. And so I think what's really interesting for qualitative researchers is the way that we construct meaning in interaction with other people. So I can't tell you how many times, and I know this has happened to Sarah, that someone after interviewing says, I can't thank you enough for this opportunity. I haven't really had a chance to tell my story in the way that I have with you. This has made all the difference for me. And so I think what's really interesting is that it's not about finding out. It's also about interacting with some people asking those questions that really tap into what no one's really talked to them about before. And that's where qualitative data pulls out in a depth that you can't when you ask a surface level sort of question, um, generally speaking for the whole population. Interesting. I'm well, and, and here I am getting my at home master's degree. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's legitimate for sure. <laughs> yeah. 
Uh, compared to some of the degrees I've seen online from some of the people selling stroke snake oil. Uh, I'll, yeah, I'll, yeah, yeah. Yes. <laughs> uh, so, so, Patricia, I mean, your background and writing, like I said, it's focused on sort of organizational and health communications. And we've seen a ton of stuff happening in this area over the last 20 or so years from the dialogue around uh, the original uh, Clinton health care plan in the 90s to the changes that we started seeing happening in, in, in the 2000s and, and beyond. Uh, I mean, how have you seen the language around health and disability been evolving in this broader context as society is, is talking more about these things? Well, I can talk about it in terms of health and organizations. I know Sarah will have much more to say about the disability, but I think what's been happening that's absolutely fascinating is that when I first started working in this area in the early 80s, uh, you saw a lot of people having what you might call the theory du jour. Here's our theory about how things work well in organizations, and we'll develop a program, we'll have our employees do it, check, done. And I think over the course of the last decade, especially, what we're seeing is the recognition that these are not one-time, one-shot programs that we can do, and we can't check them off easily. They're really starting to see how the whole issue of health and organizations isn't just about checking off we have a wellness program, that there's so much more to that personal, professional balance, that work home balance. And so the boundary, the boundary around organizations isn't so solid as it used to be. And wow, is that ever the case now with the pandemic? And so we see more people paying attention to what does social justice mean? What does it mean to communicate in ways that don't just tolerate difference? but really embrace it in our interactions with each other. And so there's been a huge shift, and I think that shift is becoming even more rich as we face the pandemic and faced, um, you know, our issue of Black Lives Matter and becoming anti-racist in our society. Those are two big issues happening at the same time and are really shifting the ground of communication and organizations and communication and health. One of the things that's, that's great to see about so many of the diversity and inclusion programs happening in organizations is the inclusion of people with disabilities in the discussion and in making that a focus of, uh, of what we're doing. And, you know, you see that just from some of the other things that I, I've encountered is that the whole idea of accessible design is really, it's just good design. And mm -hmm. a lot of the times the issues folks with disabilities encounter um, is from people who just haven't thought about it. And, you know, before I had my stroke three years ago, I sort of had an academic understanding of the concept of privilege. Mm. I mean, as a cishet white male, I mean, it was... Uh, not something I've really thought about, really had that. But once I, I uh, started living life as a person with disabilities, it's like, oh, oh, that's what you mean. That's what you're talking about, about things you just haven't had thought, think about before. And that included things like, you know, even when I was in the hospital, a story I've told before is that each morning at breakfast, even on the stroke floor, one of the things they gave us, you know, we had our English muffin and we had our little jelly packet. And that jelly packet was... Like that one you see at at the the, oh, gosh. the diner, which is the little plastic thing, which you got to open up and then scoop out. You know, even if I could open it up, there is no way to scoop jelly out of that thing with one hand. Mm -hmm. And I talked to the hospital folks about that uh, a, a couple of years later, and they're like, <laughs> oh, oh. And then they made a change within a couple of weeks. Uh, but those are some of those things that, you know, this dialogue just now starts to make possible. Mm -hmm. So so now, Sarah, I know your work has been a lot more around advocacy and activism and around ableism. Mm -hmm. And, uh, of course, we've been talking a little bit about ableism here. I know a lot of folks haven't uh, encountered it before or haven't encountered the term. Because I've really only seen it within the last 10, 15 years. Mm. But how would, how would you 
go ahead and define ableism to folks who are maybe just encountering the idea for the first time or taking it seriously for the first time. Right. I I think you're right. This term is becoming more and more out there. But of course, this year is the 30th anniversary of the ADA, the Americans with Disabilities Act. And so there's been a lot of activists trying to get this understanding of ableism out there, which is essentially prejudice against people with disabilities, or some people would call themselves disabled people. Right. So that's that's an interesting language choice. So more and more people are thinking of themselves as disabled, as an identity, as a a potential source of pride, and owning disability and trying to push back against ableism, which is this idea that disabled lives are inherently less worth living. That And I, th- I yeah. think that's one of those things we started mm-hmm. hearing, which reared its very ugly head back in April when they started talking about oh. rationing care at hospitals during the initial COVID spike. And yep. maybe disabled people or people with disabilities should be lower priority for, for <laughs> ventilators. And it's like, whoa, whoa, wait a second here. Yeah. And so that's that's an example of institutionalized ableism. Right. So the ways in which policies or even practices like giving you a jelly packet that you cannot open <laughs> reflect the fact that people with disabilities or disabled people are often an afterthought that they should that they elicit pity and potentially disgust and contempt in different ways. And so when you see COVID-19 and policies around that, it's this idea that, well, you know, being they're already disabled and they're not living their best lives. And so maybe we just shouldn't put them first on the list to get access to a ventilator. Um, So that's how this prejudice of ableism seeps into our healthcare system. So I, I think one of the things that's been really interesting, too, is that in the evolution of dealing with that, we're seeing, we talk about the rise of things like cyber activism, which I, I think one of the things that's really eye-opening is just how social media for, you know, all the ills it has has also had tremendous benefit for people with disabilities and disabled people, allowing people to connect and raise their voice in a way that just wasn't feasible before and the eye-opening stuff you see on the uh hashtag twitter hashtag <laughs> ables are weird is is just astounding how yeah. how this opens that up yeah and there there are several really powerful hashtag movements out there so for instance Crypt the Vote is one that um, Alice Wong started this Crypt the Vote movement. And it's thinking about... And she has a fascinating she, feed to follow oh, as man, well. Yes. Amazing. Yeah, her stuff is really great. But it's it's a, a, a hashtag movement designed to recognize that people with disabilities have a collective voice, that we're citizens in the United States, that policies should be made that recognize disability and help to create more accessible spaces. So, and you've seen there's hashtag movements even just emerging from um, COVID. There's, well, there's one called Nobody is Disposable, which I, mm. I think is really fun <laughs> because, you know. Nice little play on words there, too. Right. Nobody is disposable. Nobody is disposable. Thinking about the problems of ableism in emergency room triage. And that some bodies get treated as more disposable than others, that they're less, you know, we're not going to prioritize treatment of these folks over here. And so hashtag movements have emerged to push back against against that. Yeah, and and, and that is some of the really powerful stuff. And I'm going to be uh, linking to several of those those hashtags over in the uh, over in the show notes. I think we got the uh, preview of this this movement. Uh, from people with disabilities uh, in the COVID context, you know, a year ago around the whole ridiculous plastic straw bans, Mm -hmm. uh, which was that whole movement that happened without listening to the voices of, of people who need them to live. Right. Yeah. And so oftentimes these hashtag movements, social media allows that voice to be kind of crowdsourced up into and then the general media starts writing articles from the disabled perspective which didn't usually happen 
before. Now there there are a lot of articles. The New York Times, I know, has a a, a pretty good um, series of articles written from folks with disabilities explaining their own perspectives on different issues like that. So when we're talking about the impact of different perspectives, and obviously we're talking about a lot of this activism, and there's a lot of overlap here with, you've already mentioned the uh, Black Lives Matters movement. I mean, we're recording this in August 20, uh, 2020. So the killings of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, and, and others are still sort of front of mind as this movement and the protests continue. How are you seeing the protests and the discussion around Black Lives Matter and around marginalized communities uh, impacting the discussions around disability? Is it elevating more voices around disability or is it crowding them out in the active activism space? Um, and I think w that also then, of course, gets to the question of intersectionality because, you know, just because because you're not either black or or disabled <laughs> you can absolutely you be can. both, you can be both. <laughs> uh, disability uh, of course transcends all racial and demographic barriers yeah so intersectionality i think that that term is it's kimberly crenshaw is a, a black feminist scholar who made this term really it, it's i think more and more people are becoming more familiar with this idea of intersectionality and the idea that people have overlapping identities that may be sources of oppression and also may be overlapping sources of privilege. So when we see Black Lives Matter, that movement is becoming more and more intersectional, where disability activists are starting to say things like, you know, the people of color who, you know, face violence from police officers, they often also tend to be, to have disabilities of various types. Um, they also, are more likely to be wrongly convicted of crimes. They also are more likely to experience abuse in our um, criminal justice system. And more and more, there are disability activists who are also people of color who are saying things like, you know, a lot of the big organizations around disability ac advocacy and activism also tend to be very white. <laughs> So we need more voices of color incorporated in disability rights movements as well. I spoke with uh, an organization, uh, an activist. Her name, or their name, is T. L. Lewis, and T. L. created this organization called Herd, um, H. E. A. R. D. And it basically looks at the fact that there are people who are deaf, and they are wrongly accused of crimes and oftentimes they're people of color. And when they're interviewed by the police, they often don't have access to interpreters for, um, you know, so they're deaf, they don't have access to interpreters. They use spell signing. Not all people who are deaf actually use spell signing. And as a result, they get wrongly incarcerated. And then once they're in jail, they don't have access to things necessarily like um, video phones. And so they're really, really isolated in jail. And so there are more movements emerging around this intersection of disability and the racism and police brutality and all of these things that are bubbling up right now in the, the Black Lives Matter movement. Yeah, it's really interesting. A couple of things that, that come to mind. Um, first of all, I, again, there when we talk about privilege that we have, I, it's like I, I know that I do have a level of privilege because right now if i were to be stopped by the police and told to put my hands over my head i cannot do that mm -hmm. i could put one hand up i cannot put the other up or if i try to raise the other mm -hmm. it may fall quickly and i am fairly confident that i won't be shot at during that context mm -hmm. uh were i not a white guy i'm not certain i could be that confident in that not being able to comply with instructions because I physically cannot comply with instructions to hands over my head. Right. Exactly. Um, the other thing that I think is really interesting when you talk about uh, the folks who are deaf, who are living with, who, who deal with being wrong, wrongfully convicted and then not having access to those resources. 
one of the things that comes up in the stroke discussion and uh and again i'm you know just sort of a parallel thing not saying this is the same thing is the challenge of delirium mm, mm-hmm. because uh as an actual medical condition that one of the things that leads to it is when somebody is hospitalized with a stroke they're already contending with their brain damage and then they may not have their glasses they may not have their contact lenses they may not have their hearing aids and when you lose that sensory input it does things to your mind in that context you're suddenly out of communication you're not able to establish those relationships the same way uh which can lead to issues with delirium with folks when these things compound one on top of another and being cut off from your ways of communicating, whether that's going to be in prison, whether that's going to be in custody, mm-hmm. has got to just make it harder to maintain that healthy, uh, a, a healthy uh, mindset. Right, exactly. So, I mean, we've been talking about a lot of this stuff here and a lot of these challenges. I think one of the other challenges we see uh, bubbling up in the community of people with disabilities as we hear more of these voices is the challenge of inspiration porn. Mm. The idea that as content is produced, it's to hold up a person with disabilities as just this icon of, I can, they can do it, so can you, because you don't have those mm. disabilities, so obviously you can do what they can do. Um, how do you navigate the process of talking about disabilities in your field of study and even in uh, falling in love with the process, stroke survivor's story, while avoiding falling into the trap of inspiration porn? Yeah, and that's a really great question. Um, Because I do, I study inspiration porn in mass media, right? So oftentimes you'll see articles in the media that are clear examples of inspiration porn. So for instance, there might be an article about uh, how nice this young man asked this woman in a wheelchair to the prom. Isn't that nice that they're, that he's being nice to a disabled person or a person with a disability, right? So there's stories about how nice it is that non-disabled people are treating people with disabilities nicely, right? <laughs> and you're like, okay, you can't, uh, you know, and there are very, there are comparatively fewer stories written from the perspective of people with disabilities talking about what they're accomplishing, what they're thinking, et cetera. I think one of the challenges for me as an academic, especially as an academic who doesn't identify as disabled at this point, is that I don't want to speak for people. I think that's when you get into the trap of inspiration porn because you've just treated this person as an object who cannot speak for themselves. And so as a qualitative researcher, then, that means that a lot of my research is involving gathering people's perspectives and allowing them to speak in their own voice in my research, using a lot of direct quotes um, in the book in Falling in Love with the Process. A lot of it is Bill speaking directly to his own story in his own words. So that's, that's part of it, is making sure that everything that I do is including somebody actually living with whatever the disability or condition it is that I'm studying. The other thing that happens with inspiration porn is when the experience of disability gets overly simplified. So if I told a very simple story of Bill experiencing a stroke and then working real hard and then voila, he's fully recovered. That, to me, becomes problematic because you can talk about that as inspiration porn. All you have to do is work really hard, and you will be just like you were before stroke. And you, non-disabled people, all you have to do is work really hard, and you can accomplish anything. Isn't that inspiring? And so in this book, we have to complicate Bill's story. We have to tell the story of how even when he's doing a lot of great work with other stroke survivors, sometimes it doesn't work. Sometimes Bill has a lot of emotional challenges because he's trying to help people and it's just not working out. In the book, we have to point out that just because you don't recover fully, you don't get back necessarily to what it was like pre-stroke, doesn't mean that you failed in your recovery journey. And that the expectation of just 
moving from disabled back to able-bodied is the thing that you should always be striving for. Rather than thinking about how people can have valuable lives and really meaningful experiences with a disability. So those are some of the complexities that we have to make sure to include in, in the stories we tell in this book and elsewhere. And I think another complexity that we often forget about is there's this assumption of speaking about whatever you're going through. And one of the things I think that both Sarah and I have found in our research is that when people are going through certain things, their best way of coping is to not talk about it. Uh, I'm right now working on a memoir about losing my mom at 17 to cancer. And a lot of my memories and my brother's memories show her covering up and not talking about her cancer at all because she was diagnosed seven years before she died. For her, silence was coping. That's not true for everyone. But for her, she wanted to be a mom. She wanted to be a normal, quote unquote, person. And for her to talk about cancer made it real and made it problematic and just compounded her fear of dying. And so there's a part of us that said, I wish she would have talked to us. I wish she would have told her story. Um, but you have to recognize that different people going through whatever they're going through with a disability, with illness, with an accident, they need to choose for them what works. And I think our assumption that you need to speak and you need to tell your story is sometimes problematic. And also when you have folks with aphasia and spe speaking might be a fraught experience, writing might be a fraught experience. So part of it is recognizing that people can express what it is they're going through in different ways. I, I think one of the things that uh, I've been thinking about more lately and <laughs> that I've been cautioning folks too is that folks who listen to this show, uh, I love each and every one of you, uh, but... Uh, <laughs> Yeah. Also, folks like me and and Bill and, you know, Cam, who I know you talked to on the Hand in Hand show uh, recently, and all the other, you know, and Joe and Lauren and all the other folks with uh, brain injuries and stroke who run shows and and who talk to people and share stories, um, that it's important not to compare your story to our story because not you know we're a self everybody who appears in these shows is a self-selected group of people who want to share their story with the broader world and that's not every stroke survivor that's not every tbi survivor and uh it's important to understand mm -hmm. that they, you know we're saying hearing more and more people post now that comparison is the the, the thief of joy um, it's about providing that additional perspective, but it's not the only one. Yeah, and I think that's why it was important for us in this book. We interviewed a few of other stroke survivors who Bill had encountered, and they give slightly different experiences. They have Their strokes were different, their recovery process were different, the way that they think about recovery is a little bit different. So it was important to include... Uh, a, a wider array of perspectives about recovery from a stroke survivor's perspective, you know, than just including Bill. So I, I think one of the other things that I, I wanted to, uh, to ask a little bit about then is wh what have you personally learned from Bill from, from working with Bill or from this process? Oh, so much. That's such a good question. Um, I think the drive that he has to tell his story is inspirational to me. Not inspirational porn, but inspirational to me. <laughs> uh, he, he just doesn't quit. And even though he's had moments, and Sarah mentioned that, where he's worked with a stroke survivor and the stroke survivor doesn't keep working and doing the things that he's recommended and they're back to square one again. And Bill gets, he gets sad about that. He gets depressed about that. Um, 
But then he comes out of it. He figures out a way to say, I am not going to quit. And so for me, his resilience, his drive to tell his story, and bottom line, I've just learned, I mean, gosh, he's 85 now, and he enjoys life, and he is still driving, and he is still helping other people, and caring for the ducks and caring for animals. And so for me, he inspires me to say, one, you can face a debilitating stroke. You need to put in the effort, which he did for many, many, many years. He will tell you that he is still in recovery. And so that drive and that resilience is is just really inspiring to me and something that I feel like I want to model in my own life. I think for me, the two main lessons from knowing Bill and also getting to know all the, all of his other friends, you know, that we got to talk to all the other people in his life is the value of feeding relationships. Bill is the kind of person and, and, us. and <laughs> that's, his, that's part of his relationship, right? That's what a very primary relationship for him. But he is so loyal in his relationships. We see it in the ducks, right? Going to the lake every single morning. But everyone we talked to told us how Bill maintained their friendship over years and years and years. Would call frequently. He he emails and calls me all the time now too. (laughs) I've been incorporated into his like friend network, which I love. Um, But he is an example of how a person builds this network of folks who they are, you know, once you're his friend, you're his friend for life. And that's what it, his friends would tell us frequently. <laughs> and and so that's something that I learned is, is the skill uh, it takes and the um, commitment it takes to maintain these kinds of relationships over time, over a lifetime. And um, so that's one of the things that I, I learned from Bill. And the other thing that I learned from him is the value of being creative, like he, he's like, he would encounter problems in his recovery. Like he, he would say, Oh man, my, my fingers keep curling up and that drives me nuts. What do I do about that? And he's like, he would take his mom's hair curlers and put them over his fingers and his little splints and he would sleep with a book over his hand and he, he would come up with all these like kind of zany ways to try to, to solve this problem. But that, if it's, yeah. if it's stupid and it works, it's not stupid. Right, right. And, and I love the irony of using curlers to straighten <laughs> exactly. each other. I know, that's funny. <laughs> I didn't that. That's really good. <laughs> I know. That's great. But he would, you know, he would just, if he was having trouble with opening the door, he would make it a, a game out of, it, out of it. He would say, you know, I have to try to put this key in this lock 10 times in a row. And so thinking about the way that your ability to be creative in response to any challenge in life, whether it's a stroke or just, you know, the general challenge life throws at you. I think that's an inspiring lesson that I've taken is cultivate that creativity. Yeah. And I think uh, following that, Sarah, is the fact that when you cultivate it, it comes back. When I think about Tom and Melanie coming in every day in the hospital and leaving a postcard of one of the trips that they took together as friends, um, that just keeping that reminder of who they are to Bill and who Bill is to them. I think that cultivation, and and we know from all the research that one of the best things that people, especially as they age, can do to maintain their resilience and their their love of life is to keep that friendship network alive. And rather than becoming more solitary and staying at home and not getting out and not being with friends. So we know that that serves, serves him well. And that's really, like you say, a lesson we've learned from him too. And that brings us to our hack of the week. Well, Bill mentioned that singing was sometimes easier than talking for folks with speech aphasia. And so that was one thing he would ask um, stroke survivors to, to sing him something instead of trying to say it. And sometimes that, that helped um, them. Exactly. Uh, so, Patricia and Sarah, this has been fantastic. If folks want to know more about you and what you're up to, where should they go? 
Well, I have a website, uh, patriciageismartin.com that they can go to. Uh, Sarah and I also have a Facebook page for falling in love with the process. They can go there. We've got our bios there and we've got lots of different events that we've had. Um, both of our university, uh, have bios and vitas, uh, me at San Diego State School of Communication and Sarah at the Department of Communication at Rollins College. And I don't know if there's something else you want to mention, Sarah. No, feel free to email if you want to connect or have any questions. Um, I'd be happy to chat with you. Me too. If you want to hear my conversation with Bill, you can go ahead and listen to the previous episode. And that was episode 110 of the StrokeCast, available over at strokecast.com slash Bill Torres. These days, it's not uncommon to hear about a book through a public relations agency. Um, that really means that they are doing their job really well. And when the PR folks first reached out to me about talking with Patricia and Sarah, uh, I almost said no. And the reason for that was that I looked at this request and I looked at what I could see about the book and I, I had a few concerns just at first glance, which was, you know, first the question was, why would I want to read about a survivor when there were so many books written by survivors that I can read? Wouldn't it be much better to hear the story in their own voice? And Bill was not a co-author on this book. And I was also thinking, why are these people writing about Bill? Shouldn't he have the privilege of telling his own story and getting his name there? Is this somehow taking advantage of a person with disabilities? After all, I, you know, sort of navigating this space, I don't necessarily identify as a journalist here. I identify more as a storyteller, but... I think there are still some moral obligations and ethical obligations there to not support exploitation. So I started asking some questions. Uh, I didn't want to say no right off because, well, you never know what, what, what can happen. And even when your first instinct is to say no, sometimes it might make sense to uh, just get a little bit more information first. So I asked some questions of the uh, PR folks. I heard back from Patricia and Sarah, and I uh, went to Facebook for some well-reasoned discussion. And and shockingly, on Facebook, somehow or other, I found well-reasoned discussion uh, to sort of figure out what I was going to do. I, I suppose it helps to sort of try to curate your friends list with people that tend to be reasonable and smart and that you actually like. Uh, Who to thunk? You should ha be friends with people that you like. Out of that discussion, it was uh, stroke survivor, author, and two-time stroke cast guest Christine Lee, who actually suggested the solution that, you know, I really should have seen all along. And that was two interviews, so that I could conduct an interview with Bill and conduct an interview with Patricia and Sarah. Maybe do them in one show, maybe do it as a two-parter. And that way we could actually hear and understand those different perspectives. So thank you, Christine. Uh, even these things that, you know, just seem so obvious and seem like such a simple solution. In the moment, you don't necessarily think of them. And you need that outside voice to sometime, to make that, that, that suggestion. And that really did help frame what I wanted to do. And that's how these two episodes came about. Uh, I worked with the team and was able to uh, talk with Bill and really understand his perspective more and how this book came about and realizing that, you know, this is exactly what he wanted uh, to have Patricia and Sarah tell his story so he could meet with them and share the stories of his life and his stroke and his recovery, that they could then go ahead and do the additional research to provide the background information for the book and to really collate his stories into a more comprehensive look at his life and at the lives of other stroke survivors. So ultimately, I'm really happy how it turned out. I got to spend time listening to Bill, and I got to spend time with uh, Patricia and Sarah talking about communication theory in a way that I haven't really done since college. And, you know, 
that's a lot of fun. Uh, of all the things I, I I nerd out about, I didn't expect it to be uh, talking uh, pathos, ethos, and logos with a couple of uh, PhDs in communications. But here we are. <laughs> anyway, by the way, I know I mentioned it a couple times in that episode, but pathos, ethos, and logos are also key elements of how you tell a story, how you make a point, and how you uh, help persuade folks. And I talked a lot more about pathos, ethos, and logos over in my other show, Two Minute Talk Tips. Uh, and I am going to go ahead and link to that episode in the show notes here. So why am I telling you this? First of all, for survivors, what I will say is go ahead and tell your story if you're comfortable telling it. Because for every story that you hear on this show or in a support group or on another podcast or on a YouTube channel that brings you joy or brings you comfort or brings you knowledge or brings you a sense of community, know that your story could be that for someone else. And if you're not comfortable doing that, whether that's going on a podcast, starting your own, starting your own YouTube channel, blogging about it, uh, or uh, writing a book, putting on a, a stage show, whatever, if for whatever reason, you're not comfortable but still want to share your story. And by the way, if you're not comfortable with it, that's fine. That's perfectly okay. Not everybody's going to be comfortable with doing this sort of thing. But feel free to go and find your own Patricia and Sarah, the people who can ultimately tell your story with you. And with that, I'll say that's it for this week. To learn more or to buy the book, head on over to the show notes at strokecast.com slash process. Share this episode with your favorite academic, professor, or communication theory nerd in your life by giving them the link, strokecast.com slash process. Follow me on Instagram at bills underscore strokecast. And of course, as always, don't get best, get better. Thanks a lot. I'm Bill Monroe. I'll talk to you soon. The Stroke Cast, Bill Monroe, and Bill's guests provide general information and entertainment, not medical advice. Please do not make any changes to your treatment plan or the execution of your treatment plan without first consulting your personal doctor or medical team. The Stroke Cast is a proud production of the Currently Speaking Podcast Network. Thank you.